Hi y'all, good morning. For this video, we're gonna be doing a snow scene with some sun bursting through the trees using a three color palette of icy blue, lunar blue, and sepia. But that icy blue is a mix. <laughs> it's phthalo blue red shade, phthalo turquoise, and a little tad of sepia. I mix it stronger with the phthalo blue red shade. I tone it down with some turquoise, the phthalo turquoise, and then I neutralize it with a tad of the sepia and it makes this beautiful icy blue color. When you're mixing up, test your color because you're gonna have a dry shift, meaning that when it goes on wet, it'll appear darker, and then as it dries, it'll appear lighter. So you wanna get that beautiful, icy, winter sky. I'll be doing a gradient wash where I apply the paint in an elliptical oval to create a focal point. I add the paint and then I slowly add water to my brush and I just blend down into the bottom area. And I continue to do this until the entire paper has been wet and blended. And then I let it be and let it dry. If I go back into these areas, I'll create blooms, backgrounds, blossoms, things we don't want. <laughs> So love using the sky to enhance the focal point and drive the viewer into your painting. Remember, let it be, let it dry 100% before starting your tree line. Did you know that that is actually one of the secrets to watercolor success is letting it be and letting it dry. When you paint a section, just leaving it alone because sometimes what appears rough are mottled or messy, wet, as it dries, the watercolor will just paint itself. <laughs> okay, 100% dry. We're gonna start our tree line using those beautiful sepia, lunar blue, and icy blue colors interchangeably. Another great rule in art is repetition with alternation and variation. Oftentimes I'm asked during demo, I notice that you keep changing which color you're painting with. Why is that? And it's just following that rule of wanting to have variation and alternation in my paintings, in all things, in the angles that I paint the trees, the thickness of the trunks, the coloring um, of the trees. In my reference photo that's kind of peeking in the bottom corner of my video, the trees almost looked solid black or, or brown to me with these icy blue background and shadows. So I decided that I would just play with these beautiful granulating colors and just allow the colors to mix and mingle on the paper to just enjoy the beauty of watercolor. Now, sepia and lunar blue are both categorized as granulating, but they're completely different in the way that they granulate. So with sepia, I feel that you get a solid color with this little bits of sediment that'll settle into the texture of your paper. Where lunar blue, it has lunar black and manganese blue mix. That's what the color is. So it has a different kind of granulation. Now it still has sediment that falls down into the hills and valleys with the lunar black. But to me, those particles seem a little bit bigger. And then there's this magnificent color separation that happens where the manganese blue and the lunar black will push and pull from each other and other colors that they blend into. So here you have two very interesting colors and when mixed together, it's a delight. <laughs> it's hard to see on this video, so I just recommend trying them out. Another fun fact about them is they're not very staining. So they lift well. And at the very end of this video, you'll see where I, I'm able to lift some rays of sun peeking through the trees. You can also lift back areas of foliage that just doesn't work out very good. Whenever you're painting trees, I, I, I always find my ugly tree. <laughs> it's like I'm painting, I'm, I'm getting my rhythm, but somehow, some way, some of the trees turn out and some don't. So by using colors that lift, you can go ahead and take a thirsty wet brush and just lift some of those out, wait for it to dry, and then paint some more trees back in. To find out if a color is going to lift, you can look at its um, how much it stains. For instance, many manufacturers 
will have this listed on their website where it'll give it a rating of how staining a color is. Now, the more staining a color, the harder it is to lift. And oftentimes it won't lift back to the white of the paper, but will leave, of course, a stain. <laughs> so you'll be able to lift back lighter versions of itself, where if a color is non-staining or low staining, you can lift it right back to the white of the paper if you want. If you've watched any of my other videos, you'll notice that lifting is a huge part of my process. I didn't have the hand for a lot of masking and a lot of times the types of painting I want, I would have to mask large areas with masking fluid and then let it dry and then paint. The problem for me is when I would pull the masking fluid off, it would leave you know some hard edges or edges that weren't very flattering. So I would end up lifting and scrubbing <laughs> those edges back. So I realized, well, why not just lift, you know, instead of masking, why not just lift those areas back when I want to? And that's when I began the process of using stencils. So that way I could control what part of the painting I want to lift. And then as that process furthered, I, you know, began making my own stencils and designing my own stencils to work with my subject matter. Now, I lift using a thirsty brush or you can lift with um, a toothbrush. I, I use a medium um, firm of firmness of a toothbrush to lift and I've just been really expanding on that and working on techniques with that and I, I find I like it a lot better than using the masking fluid. I'll still use it from time to time, but so yeah, it's very important to um, practice that because now that I've been developing the way that I do lifting, I'll use staining colors now where before um, I, I didn't have that confidence to scrub hard enough. I was scared I would, I would harm the paper, but with practice, you'll learn just how much pressure and just how much the paper can take. Knowing that you can bring the light or white back of the paper is also very supportive to know while you're painting because if you're getting areas of ugly trees, <laughs> you know that towards the end, you can lift areas back and then repaint as needed. The brush that I'm using is called a Tri-Wedge Brush by King Art. I'll go ahead and add a link and discount code in my description box. I use a scrumbling or scrubbing or scribbling kind of movement with the brush to create different types of shapes. You might notice that sometimes I use the pointy tip at the end to create um, the different branches, trunks, and whatnot. You may also notice the angle or degree of angle that I have with the brush. Sometimes it's pointing straight up in my hand and other times you'll notice that I'm doing this scribbling motion while dragging it from side to side. That's another great thing to explore with your brushes is not always holding them the way you would hold a writing pen or pencil, but holding them in a variety of ways. For instance, if you choke up and hold close to the brush, um, the actual fibers of the brush, then you're going to have a lot more control where when you hold farther back on the handle, you'll have a, a much looser brush stroke. So remember how we were talking about variation? So I would recommend also trying to remember that you're going to be having alternation and variation with the shapes of your trees, the height of your trees, the width of your tree trunks, the coloring of your trees, and also carry that over into the brush strokes you use, how you're applying the brush strokes, how you're using your brush. And when you incorporate this into the way that you think when you paint, you might find that your paintings become a little bit more um, expressive. Here you can really see the dry shift where I'm painting currently compared to towards the right where the paint has had time to dry. Now, depending on how light or dark you want your trees, just remember add more paint, more pigment to increase value and more water to decrease value. This painting was done timed in order to be able to do a successful demo this week. So 
I didn't paint it in a way where I would go back and do many layers. But if I was doing this painting without being timed, what I often will do is have a really faint background of some trees, like ghost trees or shadow trees in the background. I'll paint them very pastel, very light, and then let that dry and then paint a few more trees much, much darker. And that will create the illusion of having trees set back and set forward. So while this video is a great introduction to techniques and brush strokes and color variations and that kind of thing um, to apply to your snow painting, I would encourage you to take your time with it. And you know, you can do lifting, you can do value changes, you can do so much to add to the illusion and enhance your painting. As I finish up my tree line, I'm hoping that the bottom of it will still be wet so I can kind of pull that color into the shadows that the trees will be casting on the hillside. Isn't it funny that we're painting a snow scene but we're not painting the snow, we're just painting all the supporting characters that will suggest snow. For instance, this tree line to suggest it's a hillside and then the cast shadows to suggest that it's snow, the coloring of course. It's just, a, it's an interesting thing to paint snow because often all you're doing is adding some icy coloring or shadows to suggest snow. I really like the original gold series brushes by King Art. This tri-wedge is part of a set of tri-wedge brushes that you can get that come in different sizes. The tri-wedge brush is very similar to a triangle brush if you've ever used one of those. Also, taking your time to do this painting, I on occasion would stand up and, and step away from it to see if you have, you know, check for the thickness of the trunks. Are those, is there a variety? Check for the height of your trees. Is there a variety? And check for any repetition patterns. For instance, if you look on the right side, I didn't catch this as I was painting, but there's like a line of branches going down the bottom of it. So those are, you know, a pattern that shouldn't be there. They should be broken up. To add my shadows, I'm using an angle shader brush and I that's wet with water and I'm just pulling what's left of those the trees down into a pattern of shadow. So what you're trying to do is imagine where the sun will be shining through the trees and pull your shadows down that way. I try to have a little bit harder edges up towards the top of the trees. And then as I move away from the trees, I blend it with water and soften it. This is an opportunity to define how steep your hillside is too. For instance, if the slope is very gradual, your cast shadow will drag all the way across the page, where if your hillside is steeper, the shadow might just be at the very top of the slope. Flipping my paper over, I'm just going to darken some of the areas on the tree trunks. These are just final touches. The trees are still somewhat wet. The slope is wet, so just moving along. Doing, you know, softening some areas. As well as lifting some areas with a clean, wet brush. Just gently getting your brush wet, gently, you know, lifting out some of the color and dabbing on a tissue. Now we can begin to work on our little burst of sunshine, lifting with just a regular angle, a small half inch angle shader brush. I'm able to begin to suggest the area of bright sun and then pulling it down Using the angled edge of the brush, I'm able to start enhancing some sunbeams as well. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. And as always, your comments, likes, and shares 
helps my channel grow and helps other artists find this video. So if you know of anyone who might enjoy this, please pass it along. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Happy painting.